So suppose we want to prove a set claim, like for example, this useful identity. For any set S, S intersect the empty set is the empty set. How do we go about proving that these two sets are the same? So we know that two sets are equal just in case they contain the same elements. That's the definition. So if we want to do this proof, we can show two things. That if some arbitrary element x is in the first of these two sets, it has to be in the second one. And suppose we go the other way. We prove that if it's in the second one, it's also in the first one. Then we can argue that the two sets contain the same elements. Now, let's look at how we do this proof where we write out all the steps. What we want to do is we'll take, we'll do the first piece first. So let's take as a conditional premise that x, some arbitrary x, is an element of s intersect the empty set. Suppose that we could, in a process written here as dot, 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 end up deriving from that that x must also be in the empty set. But if we can do that, we're going to come back to how we do it later. Let's look at the scaffolding for the rest of the proof. Then we use conditional discharge to argue that 1 and 5 together enable us to conclude that x being in the first set guarantees that it's in the second set. Now suppose we can argue that the proof that we just did is reversible. And I've written this in green because we can't, in fact, argue that. We haven't seen the proof yet. But imagine that we can. Then we don't have to write a second proof that x being in the empty set implies that it's also in x uh, intersect the empty set. We know that. Now recall that two claims are equivalent just in case p implies q and q implies p. That's the definition of p is equivalent to q. So let's use that. And using that definition, we get that the claim that x is in one of the two sets is equivalent to the claim that it's in the other one. OK, now let's use universal generalization to go from our arbitrary x has this property to all x must have this property. And then we can say, yeah, and given the definition of set equality, namely that the two sets contain the same elements, we can assert our desired conclusion that s intersect the empty set is equal to the empty set. So we've got most of our proof, except for the guts of it. How do we do this part here and show that being in one of the sets implies being in the other? So let's talk about a technique for doing that. And the basic idea is that we're going to go from set claims to logic claims okay, using the definitions of the set operations, which recall are stated in terms of logic. In this case, we need to use the definition of intersection and the empty set. Those are the two set constructs that exist there. And we're going to derive a logical claim, in this case, that x is in s and false. You'll see why we get exactly that uh, in a minute. Now we have a logical claim. Now we can use all the standard tools of Boolean logic, reason. And in this case, we're going to derive uh, via only a single step the claim false. You'll see why in a minute. And now we're going to use the set definitions, only we're going to run them in the other order. And it, what we're going to need to derive our conclusion is the definition of the empty set. And we're going to get that x is an element of the empty set. So that's how we're going to get from 1 to 5. That's the dot, dot, dot part. Let's see how that actually works. All right, so this is what we've got to fill in. First, we observe that the definition of intersection tells us that if x is in the intersection of two sets, then it's in the first one, and it's also in the second one. All right, now we need to further use the definition of the empty set. And remember that the definition of the empty set is that it's equivalent to false. No element can be in the empty set. So now we rewrite this as false. Now we need to actually do some logical reasoning. And we simply do computation, right? Anything in, uh, and false is false. That's standard logical computation. And now we know how to go from 4 to 5. It's that we use the definition of the empty set. So we've now filled in the guts of our proof. We add the rest of it and we're done, except that notice that I haven't uh, actually filled in step 7 here. And remember, that was the step where we said the proof is reversible. And now we have to argue that that's so. And we have a proof to look at. So let's look at it. And we see that all we've used are definitions and computation. And those are reversible. So 
In principle, we have to write another proof to go the other direction. In practice, no one does. You just say, and the proof I did can be run the other direction, and we're done. So that's how we argue a claim about sets. We convert the claim about sets to logic. We use our handy tools from Boolean logic, and we convert the claims back.